I think in order to, and I'll try not to be too long-winded, but in order to understand how the Jazz Lab came to be, it starts just for a brief moment by understanding the history of music in Oklahoma City in particular. Um, if you go all the way back to the teens and the 20s, um, this was a vibrant music scene here. I mean, Oklahoma City is always set in the crossroads of uh, different areas of the country. You know, it's still personified by I-35 and I-40 and I-44 coming right through the center of the city. But um, one group as one example. There was a group that was called the Territory Band in those days, and they would travel around and play. And this was in the 1920s uh, called Walter Page and the Blue Devils. And the core of Walter Page and the Blue Devils uh, they eventually moved to Kansas City because laws changed there and there was opportunities for live music in the 30s. Uh, but that is the core of what became the Count Basie Orchestra. Those very musicians, uh, Lester Young, Walter Page and others. And so there's a tradition of, of, of music in Oklahoma City that I think is a lot richer and a lot deeper than a lot of folks understand. So having just said that, through the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s into my time, um, generations of players have been a part of that tradition. And I'm just old enough uh, at this point to uh, have been around some of those musicians that were still alive in the 80s when I started becoming involved in music. And uh, and so that's, that's part of the beauty of it. Dr. Kidwell, who was the founder of our modern jazz program at Central, at University of Central Oklahoma. His father was a saxophone and clarinet player that played in those very territory bands. So uh, Doc, uh, Dr. Kibwell, all of us that were um, a part of the program called him Doc. So Doc grew up learning how to play music in his father's band, his father's dance band, where you were playing by ear and where his dad would, would nudge him or slap him if he got on the wrong harmony on a given tune. So that's part of the practicality of what he brought to the program. Um, the next little tidbit is the reason the Jazz Lab exists is because of a man named Roger Webb. And Roger Webb uh, was the president of, of UCO. Let's see, he would have come in 1997, and I believe he was still with us. Uh, somebody will correct me on this too. I want to say till 2009 or 2010. No, it was past that, maybe 2011 uh, before he retired. Uh, but he, prior to coming to, to uh, UCO, he had been the uh, president at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah. And uh, the gentleman I mentioned one time earlier, Joe Davis, uh, was the saxophone guy and the jazz guy at Northeastern and became really good friends with Roger Webb. And Roger Webb loved uh, what he did uh, and what he did for his students. I think his love for him was seeing how he inspired his students, to be real honest. And he helped facilitate a, a facility in Tahlequah that's called the NSU uh, jazz Lab. It still exists. Uh, it's in in uh, on Main Street in downtown Tahlequah. It's a much smaller facility than ours, but it's a very very cool place. And we've had uh, a lot of friends that have taught there, and students that went to school there, students that did their undergrad there, and came for us for master's degree, uh, etc. But so when Roger Webb then came to uh, UCO and saw what Kent Kidwell and Lee Rucker had been building, you know, for the better part of 20 years, I think he, like, I want to do the same thing here. So the UCO Jazz Lab was sort of a, uh, a hybrid thing. So it was a project where it was partially the Edmond Economic Authority. So it's partially the city of Edmond, uh, partially from private donations, uh, a gentleman named Mark Neighbors uh, that owned the land the building was on. He was instrumental in that part of it. And, uh, and then, of course, the university itself. So they worked on this starting in 1997 uh, from the initial idea until when we opened our doors in January 2002. So uh, I was, that's when I came along and was actually hired full time in January 2002 when they opened. And I remember walking into the building with Kent Kibwell and Lee Rucker and looking around and Doc uh, looked at us and said, so what do we do now? I mean, it was an absolute open book uh, of what we're going to do. And Roger Webb, again, was the one that challenged us and said, you know, I want you guys to build a uh, nationally recognized jazz program. Uh, you know, at that time, we had no academic degrees in jazz, um, but we had this amazing facility. And so we started from scratch. And, uh, you know, I was initially the guy that was charged with building and running uh, the commercial recording studio. And from the beginning, I was also teaching different aspects of jazz studies, but really because of the inspiration of what what Doc, what Kent Kidwell had done, um, 
I started working on the academic degrees. So uh, the first thing I added was a minor in jazz studies, lots of paperwork, lots of academic writing. And then in 2006, we added um, what is still Oklahoma's only master of music and jazz studies. And going through the, uh, the process of adding a master's degree, it's like writing a doctoral dissertation. I'll say that. It was a lot of work, and, and I totally feel like it was worth it, but it was uh, several years worth of work to, to get the approvals and get it implemented. And, uh, and that was all really inspired because of what those guys had built for us to make the jazz lab um, have the academic side of it and actually have those degrees. And then after that time, later on, we added our Bachelor of Music and Jazz Performance. Uh, so anyway, that's that part of it. From the very beginning, the Jazz Lab was a commercial entertainment venue, open to the public every week. Um, some of the cool things about the Jazz Lab that are still there now is that our friends right next door, Hideaway Pizza, they run their entire restaurant, um, an outlet of their restaurant and bar in the Jazz Lab any night their show. So we have a full bar. Uh, patrons can order anything off of Hideaway's menu. So just picture pizza boxes constantly being walked in, um, appetizers, all that sort of stuff. So what's great about it is the public can come in, buy a ticket for a show, have a glass of wine, have some pizza, have some pasta and watch a show. And uh, so that relationship with Hideaway is 20 years strong also and uh, still going. So the commercial entertainment venue from the beginning, uh, in addition to local talent and of course jazz music, but all sorts of different styles uh, of music, uh, I think a very fair reflection of the diverse diversity of the Oklahoma City music scene. We have those kinds of artists that perform. Um, and so it's just amazing how it's continued. One thing that we were so worried about is, are the crowds going to keep coming? Because when a place is new, you're going to get a crowd. We had so much good PR at the beginning um, of it. But 20 years later, the answer is people still show up. And uh, we, we continually have people that I'll talk to after a show that say, uh, you know, this is our first time here. We can't believe that this facility, this place exists. And so uh, that's the rewarding part of it. Um, I'll mention one other uh, name, uh, David Hornbeek and a group called the Trace Amigos. That's his silly name he came up with for a group of him and two other guys that got into concert promotion. So the Trace Amigos with David Hornbeek as their lead have been promoting national acts at the Jazz Lab ever since. And, and we've had so many amazing artists. I mean, I wouldn't even try to list all the names because I'd leave out so many that I would would, would regret. Uh, but really a who's who of Grammy Award winning artist and, and so, so many amazing uh, kinds of music at the Jazz Lab. And so, uh, yeah, so we uh, that started in 2002. The academic programs came online. Uh, the commercial recording studio that I was running was very successful in the early days because, well, the model for how music was recorded and produced hadn't changed at that point. Uh, since that time, we've watched everything in the music industry be turned upside down. People no longer buy CDs. They uh, hopefully, and I underline hopefully, at least pay for a subscription to a, a music streaming service. And so uh, even the concept of albums, uh, which we still do, uh, we still produce albums. Our graduate students in jazz studies, um, their final project for those that do music production is commercial, producing a commercially viable album. So we still believe in the album, and uh, we hope that people will always feel that way. Um, but it's changed, so we've changed with it. So the commercial recording studio is now 99% educational facility that our students train with. Um, but um, everything else is, is very much the same in the sense that we still have live music and have great shows every week. Yeah. Um, last week on Thursday night, Edgar Cruz, who's been one of our mainstays for 20 years, did yet another show with a great crowd. And then Friday night was my band uh, with some guests from the jazz camp that we held and, and had a great crowd for that. And it's just rewarding that people will show up. Right. And it's not only jazz music, right? It's every different kind of style of music, uh, rhythm and blues. Uh, we have different kinds of rock groups that play. There's some bluegrass that plays. Um, so really just looking at the calendar and seeing what's there, I think people can find something for everybody. Yeah. You know? And it's three, four nights a week? Yeah, on average, it's at this point, on average, after COVID, that, that, that hurt all of us, sure. needless to say. But after, we're still Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, pretty regularly at the very least. Um, and then during the school year, there's all sorts of special shows. There's many times during the school year where there's something going on every single night of the week there that the public could come to. Yeah. Uh, whether it's a student performance or, uh, you know, a commercial uh, 
commercial group, there's always music happening. Yeah, that must be pretty special to, to kind of been in, you know, and from start to finish and start to now seeing that evolution and the constant people come through. And like I said, there's still people coming here that, that have never been there before. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that speaks volumes, didn't it? To, that you're still doing the right thing, right? Not the same crowd keeps showing up. Yes. Um, one little story. Uh, one of my favorite jazz pianists is a guy named Kenny Werner. And so uh, in the early days, I promoted shows on my own, too. Maybe lost some money sometimes. But uh, we had Kenny Werner to the Jazz Lab in 2004 or 5, and he was talking to our students. And he said, and this is a guy that's traveled the world for decades. And he said, you know, everywhere I go in this country, I get out of the airplane and get in a car and I see the same thing. There's the Applebee's and the Chili's and the McDonald's. And he was basically saying, you know, so much of our country has become corporatized and it's starting to look like a mirror image. And there are a few places in the country that are still unique. And he, you know, said, you know, there is no other place I've ever seen in this country like the UCO Jazz Lab. You know, and that was a very special, very special comment. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, that people come back is because you can't go in any other city and find a facility quite like this one. Mm-hmm.